Legislators asked if, if I didn't want to be on the senator side instead of the representative side. <laughs> it's a little well, tricky. I was on that side last time. So, uh, I don't know how many people are going to be watching the video this early. They talked more. They did talk more. Well, there were more people over here last time. I don't know who else is going to show up today. Construction for sponsoring the breakfast and Riverside Grocery and Catering for making those cinnamon rolls. And I want to know, did anyone get the uh, lucky sausage that had three patties of sausage and no biscuit? He said, there you go, there you go, he got it, okay? Uh, anyway. Like the king cake. Um, low, carb, low carb breakfast there for you. Anyway, thank you so much. And I have asked Jim Miner, from Baldwin and Shell to come and lead us in our prayer this morning as we get started. And then uh, Tom Baxter will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. What an honor it is to, to be asked to pray with, with such great and esteemed people. And, and thank you so much for coming out in this weather. And, you know, the Lord provides that too. And I'm sure he has a reason for it. But what a wet morning to start. So thank you all for being here. And uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Lord God, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this wonderful county, this, uh, this wonderful state, this most wonderful country, Father. Thank you so much for the mm -hmm. legislators that are represented here, all of the chambers of commerce that are represented here, and for this wonderful place of worship where the name of Jesus is proclaimed on, a, on an everyday basis, Lord. Thank you so much because we know that, that it's from you that whom all blessings flow, right? So thank you again, Father. Please bless this food to the nourishment strength of our bodies. Please bless our legislature as it's in session and that everything that is done out of that body is done strictly in accordance with your will and with your guidance. Lord, we love you, we thank you, and we praise you, and we ask for safety and, and, and great, great prosperity for the rest of this day and for the rest of our lives. Father, just bless us in our efforts. In Christ Jesus' holy name, amen. amen. If you would, please stand and face the flag to my right. <coughs> Join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, I really do appreciate our legislators that have come out today. I uh, want to run down the list of who you have here in uh, Saline County that serves you. Representative Mary Bentley, 
District 54, Representative Keith Brooks for District 78, Representative Lanny Fight, District 83, Representative Tony Furman, uh, who is not uh, able to be here right now and with District 82, Representative R.J. Hawk, District 81, Representative Julie Mayberry, District 92, Representative Richard McClure, I think is not here yet. Oh, I'm sorry, there he is, Dunny. Did you get your sign? Tried to catch everybody as they came in. Uh, Senator Alan Clark is not here right now. Uh, he is uh, with District 7, Senator Kim Hammer, District 18, and Senator Matt McKee, District 6. So a round of applause for them for being here in the book. We're going to get busy. This is your time to ask questions, to hear from your legislators, what they're working on. We are going to have a few guidances today. I've got my little timer up here. We are going to request that everybody only do one question at a time. Uh, if there's time and we run through everything, we will come back to those who may have two or three questions. I'm also going to set a little bit of a timer that you have two minutes to either make your statement or ask your question so that we can get to as many things as possible because they are busy right now. A lot going on and there's a broad array of things that may affect Saline County and our community that I want them to have a chance to talk to you about. But right now we're going to start, give them a couple of three minutes to tell you some legislation that they feel like they're working on that's really key for Saline County. And I'm going to start on the end down there. I'm going to let Representative Mayberry go first. I really appreciate that because I do have to skip out at 730. It's not that I don't want to see y'all afterwards, but my daughter has a doctor's appointment this morning at Children's Hospital and I need to get home to get her there. So I apologize for that. And I'm sorry I didn't make it last time, so I absolutely wanted to make sure I got here, even in this pouring down rain, to be here with you this morning. <laughs> um, I, uh, after the last session, uh, Arkansas continues to be the number one pro-life state in the country. And at the end of last session, I went, there's really no more pro-life bills that we can do. I mean, we, we, we pretty much have done it all. And it just really began weighed heavy on my heart that we need to start thinking about what's going to happen if and when, keep in mind this was two years ago, if and when Roe v. Wade is overturned. 3,000 babies are aborted every year in the state of Arkansas, statistics show. But yet, um, now, those babies are more than likely going to be born in our state. And what are we doing to prepare for those babies? We're about seven, eight months away from the reversal of Roe v. Wade. And so a lot of the bills that I have proposed this session have a common thread that some people may not understand and, and see, but they deal with, number one, a home visiting program for a new mom and a new baby that we have yet to discuss. I'm waiting on a fiscal impact to come back on that, but it would allow a new mom two weeks after birth to have a nurse come into her home to check on her and to check on the baby. And it would allow for um, program, the program has shown that we see less postpartum depression and we see less reports of, or fewer reports of child, mis, um, child abuse. Um, I have some bills that have dealt with early childhood education, whether that's tax credits to help businesses that offer early childhood care, or whether that's trying to make sure that we have pre-K facilities around the state. Um, I have some other bills that um, one failed yesterday to make sure that we can help moms uh, work remotely so that we can handle the life balance that we face when we're trying to raise a family and also work. Um, I'm going to continue to work on those types of ideas because those are important. We need to start thinking about what we can do to help those moms that might be in crisis. One bill that is already law did expand safe haven baby boxes. Some of you may be familiar. Benton, I don't know if we have Benton Fire Department here at all. 
Um, but we do have some safe haven baby boxes in Saline County that allow for a mom who might um, be in distress within the first 30 days for whatever reason, realizes that she doesn't want to keep that baby. She can bring this baby to a safe haven baby box at a fire department. No shame, no blame. And um, it's a very loving way to um, help that baby. Um, the bill that I proposed allowed it to not just be a 24-7 manned fire department, but also allows for expansion to volunteer <coughs> fire departments. Um, those are some of the common themes through most of my bills, and um, I'm going to continue to work on those. Thank you. Good morning, Representative Keith Brooks. I'm in District 78, so portions of uh, Northwest Saline County, Ferndale, Villa area, as well as uh, Chenal, West Little Rock, and Northwestern Pulaski. Uh, to kind of take off of what Representative Mayberry said, first of all, thank you for being here. It's always amazing to have people show up and are engaged. I think it's an awesome thing for our community. Uh, from, again, a little take off of what she talked about, about interacting with the opportunity for kids is uh, foster care system. It's something I've been Working on, there'll be a, an, an announcement coming on Tuesday of this week, I believe, uh, an initiative called Every Child Arkansas. Uh, that's a collaboration of 18 different organizations, including state government and organizations that are vibrant here in Saline County, such as The Call and CASA and Project Zero, uh, to ensure that we're putting a, a hyper laser focus on foster care needs of our community here, in, not just here in Central Arkansas, but all of the state, the opportunities we have to partner with, with private organizations. So I think uh, there's gonna be a lot of good engagement from Governor Sanders, as well as the legislative body to ensure that we're doing everything we can. So uh, working on that, as well as uh, some education legislation that Governor Sanders has uh, rolled out in the last few weeks. And I'm sure there'll be some questions uh, related to that. So look forward to, to good discussion of what we can continue to do to, to prioritize kids and teachers and families uh, here in Arkansas. Uh, good morning, I'm Lanny Frank, District 83. I'm north of the interstate mainly. Uh, go, I go all the way to Hot Springs Village, Fair Play, Bonsdale, and all the way back to the city limits of Bryan. Uh, I, I told you at the last meeting, I, my net metering bill has uh, made it out to me this week. Uh, it was a 20 to nothing vote. And also we have a mirroring bill in the Senate in uh, the Senator Dismain is carrying, and it passed out yesterday evening at uh, six to one. So, uh, so it's, we we have a consensus, we have a compromise, and and we will uh, end the cost shift. Now, uh, we yet to get it through uh, the chambers, but I, I feel confident that we will. Also, uh, this week I'll be running the Homestead Credit Act, moving it from three seventy five to four twenty five. Uh, and uh, I, nearly everybody in the House, everybody in the Senate signs on it. It's a good thing. Uh, you all will have a reduction of $50 each on your, on your uh, property tax. Uh, also, I had a bill that is waiting in the Senate. Uh, it allows the cities and counties uh, and the state to do uh, financing with the half cent uh, sales tax for, for roads, uh, allow them to do bonding, should I say, with it. And so it, it was pretty popular and had, didn't have much trouble moving through. Uh, I'll turn it over to my colleague here to the right. Thank you. Uh, I'm a new guy on the block. All these guys have been doing this for a little while. So uh, RJ Hawk, District 81. I've got uh, Bryant, Alexander, and Shannon Hills. Um, you know, it's been a, uh, everybody said that uh, when you get into the legislature, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. I think every one of these legislators told me that. I said, no, it's like taking that hose off, putting your mouth right up to the hydrant and turning it on and saying, let's do this thing. Um, I've actually, I've been working on a couple big bills. Uh, we're gonna be making an, an announcement here in two weeks. Um, who's familiar with NIL in the room? Pretty much everybody. Uh, we will be announcing a, a NIL deal for high school kids. Um, and before anybody says anything, uh, this is something that is going across the state because we're seeing, um, High schoolers now going to the courts to to get the same thing that, that's happening in college. Um, this was brought to us by the AAA and some others, and so uh, it's going to have a lot of safeguards in it. So where it's not going to be like the wild wild west, like what uh, you see in the college arena right now. So we'll be we'll be making an announcement on that here soon. Um, 
staying in that high school area, um, right now in the state of Arkansas, um, if you assault an official, um, whether it be football, basketball, or baseball, uh, or softball, or any other sport, uh, it's a misdemeanor in Arkansas. Um, we've got to protect our officials because they're, they're low paid. And so I filed a bill yesterday that if, uh, if an official gets assaulted right now, it will be a class B felony in the state of Arkansas if you, if you attack an official. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw the video of the official in Mountain Home uh, the other day. A fan came out of the stands and threw a haymaker on him and put him in the, in the hospital uh, for making a bad call. So uh, I filed that yesterday. Other bills that I'm working on, a lot of small business bills. Um, we uh, filed a bill and it made it through committee and the House to uh, amend the prepayment calculations. So on there are businesses that make $200,000 or more a month. Uh, they are required to do a prepayment tax bill. Usually that bill, they have to know what that prepayment is in uh, December. They make the payment in January. Then give them a lot of time to, to figure out what that cost is. So now uh, if it makes it through the Senate, it's already made it through the House, then uh, they will have starting in July to know what that number is going to be. And they'll have some time to prepare until January to get that done. Uh, and then the last bill that I'm really working on is, is going to be called the Arkansas Startup. And, and I'm working with the governor's office on this, and it's a, it's a small business bill. So I know that in Saline County, we have a lot of small businesses. Uh, I see Brooke Flack up here who just had opened up a brand new one. And um, if you are a business in Arkansas, for the first $150,000 that you make in profit, you would not pay taxes on that bill. We know that in our, or for any small business, the hardest three years for a small business are the first three years. So up to $150,000 that first year, second year, and third year, you would not pay taxes on that as a business. Working with the governor's staff, hoping to have that rolled out here in the next few weeks. Good morning. Good morning. There we go, can you hear me okay? Um, my name is Mary Bentley. This is my ninth year in the house, but this is my first year to be with Swain County. So after redistricting, I now have from Perrin, which I live nine miles from Perrin, uh, all the way down to Highway 5. So happy to be here this morning. I just want to quickly say thank you all. This is phenomenal. Uh, this is what America is all about with us getting together with you. And so we hear your input so we can do a better job at the Capitol. So thank you for taking the time out this morning. I'm really excited to be here. I have uh, been on the Public Health and the Labor Committee since I've been in the house. I'm a small business owner as well as a registered nurse, so it kind of fits all of my avenues. So I'm gonna tell you a couple things, although they're not my bills that have come out of the house, that I'm really excited about. Two bills, um, one is called ghost, ghost writing. So we know that uh, people that are on unemployment, if they sign up for an interview, and then they just don't bother to show up, we have a way now for the uh, person that had that interview to report it to uh, our Department of Workforce Services. So they miss a week of unemployment if they can't be bothered to show up for that interview. So we have 60,000 job openings in Arkansas right now. We need to get people back to work. So I think that's a great bill. Uh, Kendall and I would put that bill forth as already passed the House. I'm sure it shouldn't have any problems in the Senate. But it's just a way, I mean, if employers don't want to bother to turn into Department of Workforce Services, they don't have to, but I think a lot of people will and it would tighten things up a little bit. The other bill with unemployment is to Representative Robin Lundstrom put forth this week. So right now we have four months of unemployment, we're cutting that back to three months. So uh, we know that <clears throat> when that deadline gets there, people actually wake up, just like you have a report due, you're gonna get to work. So now we cut that down to only three months of unemployment. So again, we have 60,000 job openings in the state, and everybody's looking for employees, so we're just trying to cut that back so folks will get back to work. So those are two things, although not my bills, I'm excited about those coming out of our labor committee. Um, Senator Hammer and I have been working with a group of folks trying to focus on the nursing crisis. So I'm gonna bring that up a little bit. We just filed five bills this week, and I wanna thank Senator Hamm, diligently looking somewhere some ways we get in Arkansas to address the nursing crisis. We're not getting enough nurses out. Um, I know that uh, I was a registered nurse and we worked a long time on that. So we're just doing some things. We're talking about trying to make a, a statewide portal so where all the nursing schools and all the hospitals can say what clinic openings are available so we can get better organization on that, get some clinic, clinic hours for our nursing students helping with the uh, salary, because right now someone could be a nurse and work at the hospital and make a whole lot of money, but we're asking them to get this cut and pay to go be an instructor. So we're gonna help uh, universities with that a little bit, work with precept, there's some different things and key details, but we have got to face this nursing crisis that we have and uh, help our nurses there as well. So um, working on that as a nurse there, and uh, I think that's it for now. Looking forward to questions from all of you. Happy to be here, and thanks again for taking some time.
Good morning, I'm Kim Hammer. Here's a list of bills that I've uh, worked on, just a small portion of it. This past week, I filed a bill that would place a monument on the Capitol ground in memory of the over 235,000 babies that were aborted in Arkansas during the time of Roe versus Wade, similar to other monuments that have been placed on the Capitol. It will be very tastefully done, uh, but I think that it is a, a reminder to us of a time in our state's history, uh, like all states have the same history, that we uh, at least remember all the babies that were aborted. So that bill was filed this past week. Also uh, filed a safe haven bill that complements and works with, not against what uh, Representative Mayberry did. We had a meeting last week on that, we got all the team players on the same page and had a situation here uh, in Arkansas, uh, right here in this county, where a baby was born in a facility. Uh, there was a slip up and as a result of it, uh, what was determined to be a safe haven baby, uh, ultimately it became verbalized, which means that as soon as that happens, DHS has to step in took that baby, that was after the baby had been in the home of a potential foster adoptive parent for three weeks, a very heart-wrenching experience for everybody. And so this bill is going to help clarify that, clean that up a little bit. Uh, with regards to election integrity, uh, we have worked together as a group. We have filed 25 bills that deal with election integrity. First thing somebody may think is, man, you mean we got that many problems? No, some of this is proactive in that it addresses things that we've seen in other states. There's a uh, entity out there called Heritage uh, Foundation, and they are the gold standard of rating states for the security and integrity of your election process. Uh, as a result of what a lot of these legislators up here did the last election cycle, or the last uh, general session, uh, we moved from the bottom of the list to number four in the nation. Uh, now we're at number six, not because we did anything wrong, but some other states had their session behind us. They came in, took some of our ideas, put it in place in their state, and as a result of it, they moved ahead. So it's a race to be number one. And with everything that we've done that it's being vetted by Heritage Foundation, uh, we've already gotten positive feedback on those 25 bills. Hopefully we will be regarded in the nation as the number one safest place to vote. Um, so that is a, a big part of the energy being spent this time around. As uh, Representative Bentley shared, uh, we have been working together on these nursing bills. Uh, one of the things on the nursing bill I want to uh, express is we're going after what's called a statewide portal because each teaching institution, each provider group, uh, when it comes to the clinical times that the students need, uh, there, there's a lacking of clinical space. And so one of the things we have done, or hopefully will be done, will be a statewide portal where all institutions that teach at any level can be uh, in the medical field, psychology, mental health, whatever the case may be, uh, can contribute to the to the uh, statewide portal and then the institutions that need to place people uh, can, can kind of like shop online and find where they're gonna put them. And that should help open up some clinic spots because the big, the two key critical um, roadblocks in getting nurses in the program and out of the program, program, you gotta have enough clinical spots, but you also have to have enough instructors. If you don't have instructors, it's a real bottleneck. And so we're working on that together. Uh, appreciate uh, and the earn as you learn, which means that if you're working, say you're a nursing student and you're working in a facility over the weekend, some of those hours that you are working not only can be credited to your clinical time, but you can also work and get paid so you're not having to take away. So we just looked at a very common sense approach and these are some things come out of it. Uh, retirement bills, just tweaking the system some uh, in order to be able to make sure they are in compliance. Uh, one other big area working on is the juvenile courts. I've had like four meetings with the juvenile judges uh, that are, are from around the state. And what we're trying to do is open up the uh, Youth Challenge Program and also the CSUT Program because it is the general philosophy. If we can get them into a structured system earlier than later, then it creates more opportunity to get them straight so we don't have to end up putting them in the penitentiary later. And so we visited Camp Robinson and we're working on getting that opened up as well. Hotline investigation with state police, DHS, about consolidating that so we have better efficiencies and also greater accountability. And then uh, uh, on the unemployment one that she mentioned about Rob, I'm on the Senate sponsor on the other end. And the, the one thing I would say uh, that I want you to know about this group of legislators is we are working well together communication, but also we're helping each other in that some of us are carrying, you know, like on the Senate end, the senators are helped carrying the House members' bills, and vice versa, we go to them to get some help on the other end. Uh, so we're trying to work as a team to represent you well as a county.
Well, good morning. As you can hear, there's nothing left for us to do down here on this end of the table because they've already done everything. So it is an extremely busy time in this session. I'm going to look down and see if someone correct me, but I think we're probably close to a thousand bills already being between one and two. Between the House and the Senate, probably a thousand bills. So everything's a work. I'm watching the clock, so we as politicians have two strategies. Either let you ask questions or we run out the clock and go home. So I'm going to speak very quickly. Uh, Senator Hammer talked about on voter integrity. There's a couple of things that I picked out. We want to make sure that our elections division and state offices are providing the most accurate, up-to-date voter roll information that we can provide down to the county clerks. So it's real simple. It's out of the House, moved to the Senate. We're coming back with one that's a, a little bit of an issue that uh, is just a clarification issue on local polling sites about where does a 100-foot mark start, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Just make sure, uh, specifically, when we're in a church, a lot of times churches are used as polling places, there's a little bit of clarity that needs to be done there. So I do a lot of economic developments. You'll find me around most of those type of bills. You'll also find me hanging around. There's a package of bills and another group that meets uh, with uh, 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 Representative Bentley and several others that have to do with religious freedom, religious conscience. You're going to find me hanging around all that. I'm not going to bore you with all the details right now, so we can get to the questions. So. Thank you. Uh, the uh, I think they've covered about everything. Uh, we've got a I have a bill going to the House for, I would assume, Monday morning, or Monday afternoon, a uh, little school choice bill that uh, doesn't do a lot, but it, uh, for those affected, it does uh, quite a bit. It's the right to stay. Uh, it says that once you're out of school, uh, you can stay there. Uh, people move for all kinds of reasons. Sometimes uh, uh, there's reasons like divorce and losing a job and other things, and uh, kids don't need any more trauma. And they may be a junior or senior in high school or fourth or fifth grader. A school doesn't have to provide transportation, <clears throat> but the kids will be able to continue at the school they're at if they want to. Uh, a, a little common sense thing I think we should have done a long time ago. The uh, contemplating another uh, school choice bill, I've got it written, haven't filed it yet. You can give me feedback on it. Uh, but it says that a child can't be punished for exercising uh, school choice. <clears throat> which means that if they change schools, they can participate in any extracurricular activities uh, with, with no penalties. Uh, I think that's a very important bill. I've seen a lot of kids punished uh, because uh, they decided they wanted to change schools. If you want to punish a coach or you want to punish a superintendent or a principal uh, for so -called supposed recruiting, do it. But we need to quit punishing kids. Um, and got some other things that will probably get filed, but uh, I'll stop and let you all ask questions. And now it's your time. I'm going to ask Patrick and Jason, and I see, I can tell by his uh, pointing and looking that he's already figured out what I'm going to ask next. I think we have to use one of these mics up here at each table. And if we'll hand one to Patrick and one to Jason, I'm going to ask them as you have questions um, mm -hmm. to stand up and uh, they will come and hold the mic for you uh, so that you, we can make sure you're heard and uh, have a chance to ask your question. Uh, and if you are, just remember, I am going to ask that you ask one question at a time. We'll come back to you if you have more. We're going to try and hold the questions. I know you may want to make a brief statement also, but to a two-minute time limit. So let's go. Who has a question? Mark, I saw you first. You were real fast, and then we'll get the gentleman next to him. Um, and, and identify if it's to all of them or if there's one specific legislator that you would like to ask the question to. Okay, my name is Mark Smith. Uh, good to see you guys again this morning. I appreciate you coming out. Um, I'm going to talk about, I asked a question rather, about the solar bill. And I know I asked that question last time. And I was assured, and Representative Fife, this is not an attack on you. I know this is your bill. But um, you explained to me that because I have solar already, that I'm grandfathered in. So what I'm saying today deals with people who don't have solar. This bill will change uh, those numbers so much with solar that people that 
our residential homeowners will probably never do solar. The number we get to by the end of 2024, when, when that date kicks in, uh, th that'll be the end of it because it has crushed those numbers down so far that there'll be no incentive no incentive for homeowners to continue to do solar. This bill looks like it is a energy and co-op bill, not a consumer bill. I would really encourage you to take a look at this again. And I know uh, what's being said is that it's not fair for those who don't have solar. Well, if I go to Kroger and I get a loaf of bread on sale, is it unfair to everybody else that they didn't buy the bread on sale? It's a very simplified illustration. But I would hope you take another look at this. I know it's been before the PSC and that they've kept it the way it is right now. This will change it so much. And I don't have anything to do with solar. I'm not a solar representative. I don't own solar panels except the ones in my house. I just think you need to consider those consumers who have not yet purchased solar, are you, are you crushing those numbers so much that they would never sign up for solar? Thank you. Okay, uh, and I appreciate the question. Uh, solar is heavily subsidized. Uh, there's a 30% federal tax credit for it if you buy it. And, uh, and, and let me speak about, uh, there's a lot of solar out there that is put on the line. There is about 4,700 megawatts that come on the line every day when the sun shines, that is, of uh, uh, solar. 200 of those, there's 200 megawatts of net metering. And so compared to, you know, they talked about we're gonna kill solar in the, in the state. That does not do that. What that does, it levelizes the playing field. Uh, and solar, now you'll be reimbursed Retail price for what you put back on the line since your grandfather then for 2040. Now, anybody that buys it after this date, uh, September of 24, will be re uh, uh, reimbursed wholesale. That's what everybody else sells to the grid at is wholesale price. It's working in other states. Uh, most states are abandoning the one for one because the cost shift. Right now, we've got numbers through 21. And we got like $18 million cost shift to go to people who have solar. They enjoy that benefit of selling back retail. And it goes back and it increases the cost on everybody else who doesn't have it. About half the people can't have solar because they don't own their homes in the state of Arkansas. Then you gotta be able to be, you know, can you get a second mortgage on your house? And that eliminates a lot. And you gotta have a good credit score, which you get. So it's a fairness bill. Uh, I feel like uh, selling back wholesale is fair. Uh, and that's, that, I think it's a fair bill, let's put it that way. The solar industry, we compromised on this and they agreed on it. So uh, I feel very comfortable about where we are in the bill. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, ready to move on to someone on this side? Thank you for taking my question. I appreciate the job that all of you are doing. It's not an easy job with what you're presented with every day. My question is for vouchers and teacher salaries. Some of the schools across the state that are on the other state borders, um, some school board members in the last couple of weeks have testified that their students go out of state and go to privates there. Has there been any consideration of those tax dollars from Arkansas going into other states? Um, also, some of those schools where those children are leaving, half of their teachers are not even certified. So if we have $50,000 salaries, $60,000 salaries, how do we get teachers there that are certified to work with those students? So can I clarify that, how do we get the teachers to your existing public schools that are certified? Well, the first part of it is basically, does it matter at all that Arkansas public tax dollars is gonna to go to another state? Because that's oh, yeah. So I'll, well, yeah, I'll clarify that real quick. So uh, in the, the learners legislation, uh, there is uh, 
language specifying that this is for schools in Arkansas. Uh, there's one exemption uh, that is uh, actually being written into the bill as part of an amendment uh, even today. Uh, that there are three students, and this came from one of my Democrat colleagues over in uh, East Arkansas. There are three students who currently are autistic students, and they're on the Succeed Scholarship, and they go to a, they live in West Memphis, but they go to a school in Memphis because that's the only school that could uh, accommodate what their significant needs were. And so they're current Succeed Scholarship students, and so they will not be taken off of that. They'll basically be grandfathered in because they're existing students that, that a, a, a pretty desperate need is being met. But otherwise, uh, dollars will not flow outside of the state. They'll go to entities, uh, to schools within the state. And as far as, uh, you know, help me clarify the second question, if you would. As far as some of the schools that, you know, whether they're labeled as a D or F school and things, if half the teachers in those schools are not certified, whether we give them $50,000 or $60,000, I'm not really sure as much as we all want teachers to make more money and they deserve every penny they get, how does that change anything? How does it change if the teachers aren't certified? Exactly, as far as because everything that, that's been shown the last week, as far as that everything's gonna be changed with once we give them $50,000, all these teachers are gonna to wanna to fly in and, and become teachers. If they weren't going into education or whatever, I'm not sure it's gonna change anything in some of these areas where there's no other jobs and trying to just throw $50,000 at a person to come in there <clears throat> where maybe a spouse doesn't have a job and things like that. And you've got superintendents that have got, like I said, half their staff that may be like on an ALP and you know, per the Department of Ed, usually you have about three years to try to get them certified. Well, those superintendents are begging and pleading the state or whomever to send them certified teachers because they can't get anybody. They will not go there. So regardless of what you pay, if you don't have a certified teacher, it's gonna be a struggle for those kids to be educated and whether we get them up to reading at third grade or not with whatever courses they're taking. Certified teacher means a whole lot. Sure, and obviously the goal is to ensure that, that every school, and based upon the hiring practice of the individual school, which is, you know, the, the rules are set by the State Board of Education, but based on hiring practice to ensure that they're hiring teachers who are qualified and I'm sure that our school Administrators here would, would verify that they're uh, they're hiring folks who are highly qualified, and so our, our job as a state is to hopefully encourage uh, a, a not just a strong but as competitive a wage as as is out there in the United States for mm -hmm. for teachers, whether they're existing teachers or new teachers in the market, and to, to hopefully because Arkansas is a state, you know, the data has, has suggested the last couple of years that we're a state that people are moving into. Uh, and so hopefully the, the best and the brightest will continue to say, hey, Arkansas is a place I want to go because I can uh, earn an outstanding income as an educator uh, and also have a great quality of life with a lot of the other things that our colleagues are doing in terms of tax reduction and, and quality of life standards here in Arkansas. A question on this side of the room. Yeah. Um, I know that David Gray has a bill in uh, that's coming up on special elections. And this has been a sore spot with a lot of a lot of folks out here that you don't have enough people to show up to special elections, it's not advertised. And so I, I'd recommend that we that we uh, basically get rid of the special elections for anything having to do with money, bonds, things like that, till it, and then move it to the general election because it costs us a lot of money for each one of those special elections. And, and nobody shows up. For instance, up in North Little Rock, they just had a they had a tax uh, a tax bill or something like that. It came up there were seventy four people. They showed up for a special election. It failed by only thirty votes. That vote would have determined the tax to be put on those people had been passed for sixty four thousand people up there. That's ridiculous. You only had 74 votes that went went to that? That's crazy, y'all. I just want to know, how many people in here show up for a special election? Can you raise your hands? How many people, and, and I want to assume there's probably about less than a third. Why do, why do we have special elections? We have special elections really for emergency purposes that you have to have some, but not, not if it's going to be for, for taxes, and that's why I had you raise your hands. I want I want to see where we're at on that. Um, 
I know it's come up in the past and it's, and it's failed by like one or two votes. I know James Church was an issue that way back that uh, since James Church, he, uh, he voted for to ban the, uh, the special elections for that in the, uh, in, the, in the committee, but then he turned around and, and didn't vote for it when he got to the floor. Anyway, that's all I had to say. I just made a comment. I'll be happy to, to talk about it real quick. Representative Ray, we've uh, got quite a few coastal officers ready to file it again, so it'll allow uh, two elections every year to make sure those two elections are on primary day and on general election day. So even in an off year, they can have an election, but it'll be on our normal primary day and our normal election day, so it folks on announce election day and get more, hopefully, get more input from our constituents. So I think it's a great compromise. It's a good bill, and I, I, I think this year we have a great. We've got RJ here, but we've got a great freshman class. I'm really excited about the folks that we've got <laughs> here. So, uh, shout out to RJ. I, we'll I'm sorry, I couldn't time. understand she was talking so fast. Uh, I'm only kidding. Uh, yes. No, our, our freshman class, and, and I, I would like to say that uh, I actually co sponsored that bill with, with David Ray, and mainly the reason to what you're saying. We don't have that problem really in Saline County because. Um, we have a lot of people that do show up for special elections. I, I know, I remember when uh, the Millage and Bryant tried to get passed a few years ago, we had a large turnout uh, for people to come and, and vote for that. And we really don't have that in Saline County, but it's an issue across the state. And so, um, you know, at the end of the day, I've actually had some constituents in Bryant uh, that have emailed during this process and asked, hey, why can we not just have voting you know, either in the primary or in the general, and, and just so everybody knows when the elections are going to be held. And so I look forward to seeing what the debates look like uh, on the House floor. Okay, thank y'all. Another question. Can you hear me, Lanny? I can hear you. You've heard me more than once, haven't you? Okay. Oh, I was Folks, I I'm gonna I wanna make a quick question and make a statement. And I'm gonna bounce it back to my buddy over here who I've known for pushing 40 years, bro. Thirty you commented that y'all have worked on about a thousand bills, is that right? Would you recite them, please? But you expect us to know after you pass as small business people, is that correct? That's the reason there's an ARCLAG website that you go in there and peruse all of them, just like all of us have to do. That's my whole point. I'd rather really have you pass five good bills than a thousand that we can't keep up with. Very much statement. You need to take one thing back. Now, back to the question at hand. <laughs> Folks, I really feel like Kim have known you a long time. You sit with my mom in the hospital, and I appreciate you to this day for that. And I'm back to play, even when I didn't agree with you on things, because I think that's the way Americans are supposed to behave. But folks, we're supposed to have separation of church and state. And I've tried to stay at home and keep my mouth shut out of respect for Lanny Five, because I'm, I've listened to his counsel for longer than I can count. But I really feel like you folks are stepping over the line. You're getting to where I'm not a big fan of abortion, but we have rape and incest and things like that. And you want to make a memorial for these babies that were born. Some of them are going to be born dead or deformed. You want to put the mama through the mill and you don't give them any safe haven. Now you want to start making laws to where uh, you want to start having, you have to judge the books in our schools when you're not a teacher. You want to make a law to where they can be put in jail or something if they don't teach the way you tell them to teach. I'm sorry to do that. I'm going to make this clear. Make quick closing statement. I want you to understand something. We are, you're supposed to represent all of us. I was raised in a Christian household, and I admire you for having this facility for us to meet in. How many Jews or Muslims do you think are going to show up here? And I want to know this because I want to tell you something. You need to start remembering you're supposed to govern all the people, not just those of your religion. And you need to take a step back and 
admit that the teachers need to teach, the doctors need to doctor, and you need to quit trying to dictate morality. I appreciate that very much. Right now, at the, at the college level, uh, if you have a star athlete um, that, you know, is nationally known, then that person can have a business come to them and, and say, hey, we want to pay you X number of dollars to use your name, image, and likeness. And uh, they don't have to be an employee. Uh, they would just have to sign a contract saying they would say, hi, I'm RJ. I want to talk about Empire Cheer, and I'm going to get paid for it. Um, so... How does that equate to the high school level, right? So right now at the at the uh, college level, there's no boundaries. I mean, you can you can have as much money flowing. And so a lot of people have said, well, it takes away amateurism. It's now professional athletes at the college level, and because there's no caps, there's nothing like that. Uh, right now in Arkansas, uh, in order for a, a kid to make money at the high school level. Uh, they have to sign an employment contract with that business to be able to, to do that. So they're not really using their name, image, likeness. They're an employee, right? They're an employee talking about uh, that business. And that business, now they don't have to do anything. They have to sign the W-2. What we're, what we're looking to do is allow for that to happen but have safeguards in place. But, so saying that a child can't transfer to another school just because of an NIL deal, right? There can't be a pre-existing contract or a, a contract in place for that kid to transfer, um, as much as you know, school choice, we want that to happen, we want the kid to be educated, but not just for a, a monetary sum for them to leave to go you know, do NIL stuff for, for Walmart. One thing that is being talked about is uh, the reason why college is so crazy is because the courts got involved. The courts really kind of started dictating what the NIL looked like before there was any type of barriers to be put in place um, on the front end. So without getting into all the legislation because it's going to be released here soon, um, there's going to be barriers for high school kids um, as far as what can be done uh, without having to sign that contract. Anyone else have a response that they want to make to that? Senator uh, Clark? NIL is over my head. <laughs> uh, I'm dealing with a very simple issue uh, is that if we're going to have school choice, and according to this education bill we're going to have, uh, which I very much support, uh, I very much support the selfishness of parents, uh, that parents more often than government or anybody else will make the right decision for their kids. Uh, and so them being able to choose where they go to school uh, is a very important right, I think. Uh, and, and it's very simple, children shouldn't be punished. Uh, they're not punished. Uh, uh, if they're in the band, they're not punished for other things. And most of those who, most of those athletes who move, don't do it for athletic reasons. A lot of times it's for academic reasons and other things. But they shouldn't be stopped from playing basketball or football or whatever. And I'm against recruiting. Uh, and I think there ought to be really stiff penalties with the adults. Uh, but uh, parents and children ought to be able to make the best decisions for their kids. Thank you. I think I have a couple of questions. I've seen raise their hand in the back. And I see the gentleman over here, and I hope we can get to all three of them. So, hey, nice to see you guys. 
So my question is about Senate Bill 294, the education bill with the vouchers. Um, with that, there's a couple, there's several expenses, but there's a couple expenses um, that I was, didn't see the outlines for with where the funding was coming from. The first one with the teacher salary raises, which is excellent, that's great. Uh, the teacher salary raises, and then uh, with the other one with the money going to private school students. With the current students we have, that's, you know, what, another 175 million a year now um, going into that. So with those two combined, what, like, what are we looking at? Half a billion dollars a year in additional funding? Uh, with schools already paying, you know, 70 to 80% on teacher salaries now, where is that extra half a billion dollars a year coming from if we're not defunding public schools? Who would like to answer that? Um, Senator, Senator I'm trying to pull up. I'm trying to pull up the fiscal statement on it real quick. So, Try to answer like a couple parts of the question. So right now you've got uh, the funding matrix, and I'm sure Karen can. Uh, she's probably uh, the expert of experts on on that, as she listens to that every single day, all day long. So you've got the funding matrix, which is uh, based upon the adequacy study that's done every two years uh, that was just finished this last uh, November, which is the recommendations for the the following biennium, the following two years of funding, and looks at a per per pupil amount that funds existing. Uh, operations and, and a number of different things, you know, teacher salaries, lots of different things. And then you've got the LEARNS, or the LEARNS bill. So the LEARNS bill is the additional uh, funding for a number of different things. One of those is the teacher salaries. And so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, you've got the existing dollars that are, are coming, that always would have been coming, and that's increased on a regular basis. And then we've got the additional expectations in terms of making sure that everybody's brought up to a certain level and has the increasing raises. Uh, that's estimated $180 million a year uh, is what the um, uh, Department of Finance Administration has uh, agreed is, um, is able to be allocated for that on an ongoing basis. Uh, and then you've got the additional components, and there's a number of additional components in the bill, obviously. Uh, you know, um, literacy coaches and uh, the teacher education program, maternity leave, um, a number of different things like that, but then as far as where the money is coming from for uh, like the educational freedom accounts, uh, that's also within the additional funding that's been committed by the executive branch for uh, those specific purposes. And so that's not that's outside of the, the typical adequacy funding matrix. Uh, and so the estimated um, year one cost is 297.5 million dollars, it's actually 150 million dollars in new money. Uh, but again, that's allocated from various uh, available resources that are currently there and will be there on, ongoing. Thank you. I think, uh, were there two that were? Okay, so there's about three back there. They have some that raised their hand, so if we can move through them quickly. So, I've got a, and then we're over there. I've got a three part. The first part's not really a question. No, one question. <laughs> one question. All right. All right. There's, there's four or five people who are waiting, so. I'll be under my team, don't worry. My, uh, <laughs> I, uh, the NIL bill, I think it's a fantastic idea in college and in high school. Um, to say you're against it, in my opinion, is to say you're against entrepreneurship and against these kids finding a way to make money. Because it's not gonna last forever. 90% of the time, you're gonna blow your knee out your freshman year of college or something, and that career is over. So get it while you can, in my opinion. Two, I wanna piggyback on what he's talking about in the solar industry. And make sure that y'all thought about that correctly, because with the way it sets now and the way it's going to go, you're going to kill thousands of jobs across the state. My company is looking on bringing on here in Saline County and adding a couple of hundred jobs here alone, not counting other offices across the state. And we put the holds on it because of this, um, because come September 1st, 2024, it's not going to be sellable to residents with the way it sets. And the only person you're, you're only taking money if it stays the way it is, you're only going to be taking money from the energy and the cooperative. So. I agree with him because it is that it is their bill. So uh, that's kind of the first part. And I really think that y'all need to think about it as far as the jobs across the state that you're going to get rid of. Okay, we're going to bounce over here, and then it's Dr. Walters and other gentlemen on this side. Okay. My name is Lauren Benedict. My name is Lauren Benedict. I'm with Sandor Technologies. We're a sled and federal contractor for cybersecurity computers. Um, we're one of the largest in the state. Uh, we work nationwide, and one of the things that, that we have found here in Arkansas is Arkansas is not, is not ready for the 16 CFR Part 13 federal standards for picking 
uh, consumer information. It's basically uh, HEPA for business. Um, the IRS is going to start enforcing this starting June 9th. About 80% of the businesses that we meet with in, in Arkansas don't even know about this bill and are not prepared. It's going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to get ready over years to be able to get in compliance. If they get audited, they can get fined $10,000 to $1 million and face five years in prison, but yet nobody knows about this in the state. And many states are already working towards finding ways to help businesses get ready for this federal mandate. So what, my question is, what is Arkansas looking at to help small businesses? Because this is gonna put them out of business. Don't worry, many of y'all, we would like to help. I would say, let's get together, let you explain that to me thoroughly, and let's see what we can do. Hi, thank you, Karen Walter, Superintendent Bryant Schools. Thank you all for what you do. Appreciate it. What I want to ask you about is a topic that affects all of our Saline County schools, and that is school facilities. You guys know, and I hate that Representative Mayberry had to leave because she is actually uh, carrying a bill that's passed through the House to change the per, uh, per square foot amount that school districts receive for our school funds. Right now, that figure is $200 a square foot. I know at Bryant, I have a, a project that has been approved by the state for high school additions. When we had to submit that back in 2019, it is so delayed. We found out in April of last year that we received funding from the state. The cost today to build that building, at the time when we submitted it in 19, it was between nine and $10 million, and today it's 23 million. The costs have gone to $350 a square foot just for a building, and then at the end of 22, through the rules process, there was um, a rule put in that we have to build a storm shelter and all new construction, and that has put the cost up over $500 a square foot. All of our districts in Saline County are growing. We cannot keep going back to our voters saying more taxes and more taxes. We at Bryant had a $130 million building project that we finished in 20, depleted our building fund. I've been saving, we've already saved $7 million since 2020, but it's not been cut. It. So I would like to ask what we have for all of our delegation here. Can you guys commit that we're gonna to try to do some one-time money for those of us that have projects that have been approved that we can get some additional funds so that we can build these buildings and not have to turn that money back to the state. Thank you. I'll respond to that one. And because if I'm not mistaken, you correct me, I think I was sent a sponsor on that one with Jim. Yeah. Um, the, uh, with regards to uh, additional funding, yes, I think there's like 75 projects, but also I think as we dialogue and talk about this, uh, we need to look into what's driving the cost. Is it the uh, cost of the labor? Is it the cost of the equipment? Is it the cost of regulations that are being placed on the school districts that are maybe unnecessarily done? Some of which maybe are at federal standards, some maybe things that we have done ourselves. I think that's where our dialogue needs to occur. But yes, as far as contributing to the cost, especially if we're gonna put things like requirements of safe rooms on you that are included in that. Those are all things on the table that we've got to look at. But uh, if we want our kids to be warm, safe, and dry, then yes, that has to be part to the question that was asked a while ago about the total cost of the package. Um, you know, that's all in the big mix of things. Good thing is the state of Arkansas is growing. Good thing about Celine, it's growing. And as a result of that, uh, we've got to make these adjustments. So in answer to your question, Yes, and you know, we will be working together to get it there. A little addendum to that. This is not just K-12 schools. It affects the ASU Three Rivers. It affects your municipalities. It affects counties. Anything that's related to taxpayers, building and construction. This is a huge, huge jumping cost. It's gonna take a while for each of those entities to be figure all of that out. It's gonna mm -hmm. take some patience, it's gonna take some creativity. Right now the pressing need is the schools, so. You know, I'd one other thing, uh, because you're blessed to be the bigger school in the district, but then you got Harmony Grove sitting over here, and one thing we gotta make sure is that there's equality in access to those funds between the smaller schools and the larger schools, 
to make sure the larger schools aren't disadvantaging the smaller schools. And that's where we need to have everybody in the room and say what's what's equal and fair to everybody, mm -hmm. understanding that you're a smaller school, but you're growing, you're a larger school, but you're growing, and, and yet the building costs, if they are the same, it, it doesn't matter what size school district you are, the cost is the same. So that's, that's where we need y'all in the room to help us figure that out. And if I may, the uh, part of this cost you talked about is even more concerning to smaller schools than it is to you, and that's the, the safe room, uh, et cetera. And turns out, because we came into the session learning about this, uh, is that uh, the state's always adopted the National Building Code just straight down the line. And obviously, this one thing is going to be so expensive to our schools, and in a lot of cases, and like I said, a lot of time, especially a small school doing a much smaller project, still has to do the same, uh, the, the same thing. And so, uh, Central Petty is supposed to have a bill on that. I've uh, been waiting for him to come forward with that, but we are moving on that. Thank you. All. We have one more question, and then I think Senator Hammer wanted to make a quick remark. So. Good morning, uh, Michael Murphy. I represent Fountain Lake School District as superintendent, and, and really my question is in the general nature of democracy. And that is we've been experienced and handed a 144-page omnibus bill that carries the magnitude of a bold reform to education with minimal fiscal predicted impact. And we could discuss today all of the individual pieces and the impact, and we'd still be here a week from now. My question relates to the fact, since you didn't get the bill any sooner than we did, and that was Monday night, to begin reading 144 pages, and it's already left the Senate hearing through the Senate into the House chambers next week, will we be bold enough to pump the brakes to try to get this right, or are we going to use the learns bold approach and create a divisive nature of democracy and predict what it will look like four years from now when we choose to move this through very quickly. I'll be glad. All right, thank you so much for everyone for your uh, service at Fountain Lake and, and for asking that question. And so I think that some of the challenge would be maybe the, the misperception that it was uh, thrown out and, and, and there is no vetting prior to it. So mm -hmm. the process of, of drafting legislation, just with anything, uh, Representative Hawk mentioned, uh, he's been working on a process for an NIL bill for some time. Uh, that bill hasn't been out there, uh, and the general public won't see that bill until it actually gets filed, which is how you know, all legislation is. But in terms of the governor's uh, learns legislation, Obviously, something that she ran on and, and really announced back in the summertime of what the, the general tenets were, the focuses of the bill. And then there was a, uh, a working group of legislators, uh, along with her staff, as well as uh, getting input from educators and other stakeholders across the state that started meeting back even in November to start talking about what this looks like and what are the needs in the state of Arkansas, how do we start to address those needs. Uh, and so the legislation are being crafted uh, even back then. From, from a committee standpoint, the, the Education Committee on both the House and the Senate side have had access to the detailed language in the bill, um, which was some odd pages, uh, for about six or seven weeks. So the part, of, part of the process was uh, those groups got together because those are the ones who are initially tasked with, uh, in any part of the legislative process, are tasked with making sure that, that we vet uh, the details of legislation in, before it gets out to the full House. Uh, full Senate. And so uh, those, both those groups in both House Education and Senate Education had the opportunity to look at uh, the details of it and go through it and, and offer suggestions, comments, solicit feedback. And so that process has been going on for many, many weeks, if not for several months, uh, to make sure that, that we address this uh, appropriately. Yes, the bill did drop on uh, Monday in terms of formal language, and we've certainly been soliciting Lots and lots of feedback. Uh, I know that Dr. Walters and I had a great conversation yesterday afternoon, and uh, she was gracious enough to provide me feedback, which I forwarded on to the governor's staff last night. Uh, as I've been sitting here, I've gotten about 20 text messages uh, from other folks who have input, and, and I've gotten text messages from the governor's staff even this morning of, hey, great point, let's make sure that we get that uh, tidied up and make sure that we get that language um, amended and corrected before it gets to the House. And so we'll continue to have the opportunities to have discussions on it, 
and, and it, it will likely be in the House Committee next week. Uh, so we'll still have plenty of opportunities to, to make sure that we're doing what is right uh, by the citizens of the state of Arkansas. But most of all, taking time to focus on the needs of our teachers, the needs of our students, the needs of our families, uh, to ensure that, that we're keeping our commitment as a state uh, to provide the best education possible. And I'll add to this, there's been a narrative put out that there's been no teachers that have been involved in this process. Um, right now, on the on the committee that has helped the governor, there are three former Arkansas teachers that helped draft this bill. Um, in fact, uh, uh, Secretary Oliva, who what is Kathy's uh, uh, second command to Governor to Secretary Oliva? She was with the Rock School District. Uh, who? Les Leslie Fiskin, yes. Uh, that she's second in command right now to um, um, Secretary Oliva, and so. There are people that are that are that have worked in the schools here in Arkansas that have been helping with this legislation. It's not just the governor or secretary of leave that threw this out here. There are there are people that have been in the classrooms that have been in uh, administrative offices that have uh, helped out with this legislation. Dr. you are correct. We, uh, you know, we I've been working. Uh, on things we knew about this bill, been working with superintendents and, and others and getting questions answered and, and trying to get some things changed for some time. But I saw the bill about the same time you saw the bill. And uh, especially when this is a partnership with our educators, uh, we should have had time to read it, should have had time to go through it. As Senator King said yesterday on the floor, there's people that are never gonna agree no matter how long you take. But the rest, the rest should have had time to, to go through it, and it's a mistake. We know it's a mistake, and, uh, and because of the way the process works, you find those things that, uh, that you didn't know were there, and we're gonna, get, we're gonna pass some things that we'll be sorry about, and that the governor will be sorry about, because we didn't exercise the process the way we senior legislators know it should be exercised. Sorry? I am. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Senator Hammer did want to make uh, a quick, did you want to say anything else about the education piece or you would ask to a, a quick a statement to Mr. Pfizer's? Uh, I'll make a, uh, a comment on the education piece. The framework of the bill, the key components, the vouchers, those things, those have been well talked about by the governor, and she got elected on the basis of being very transparent about those things, and that things were not going to be different, or that things were not going to be same, that there would be some changes that would be made. The framework of the bill, which is about eight sections, I think, maybe wrong, one or two extra in there, the framework of the bill was shared, and it was, it was shared, maybe not with everybody, it was shared with the education committees, it was shared with the leadership, it was shared up a tiered approach, and the final bill, yes, was not dropped until Monday afternoon at five. There were some members that had the framework of the of the drafted bill at uh, I think it was about five o'clock on Friday afternoon. So there was there was a weekend that that framework of the bill was out there, and then the main bill hit Monday night five o'clock, and then we had the meeting in Senate Ed uh, the next. Day, I believe it was. And if you listen, there were some very pointed questions. Yeah. there. If you listen, there were some very pointed questions as a result of that. The content of the framework has, has not changed. The devil in the details is what's being paid attention. Yes, it was cleared out of the Senate Ed, which I sit on the Senate Ed. It was discussed on the floor yesterday. It was cleared off the Senate floor yesterday. And it was sent to the House with the expectation and the promise and the commitment <laughs> that with all the recommendations that are coming forward, some of which are coming from our own superintendents who have met with the governor's staff, along with some of us that are legislators, there have been some very good amendments that are gonna be put forth in the bill. As far as slowing it down, we still have the ability to slow it down in that it's now gonna go through the public health or through the, through the House uh, Committee, Education Committee, then it still has to get off the House floor, and then it still has to come back to the Senate, and we have to concur with the amendment that the House is going to be put on there. One of the rationales as far as the amendment was that it was better to have this all hashed out before we did 
that we would only do one main event amendment that would be done on the House mm -hmm. side mm -hmm. to address some of the critical issues that people have brought up to us so we wouldn't be having a bunch of amendments back and forth. So, you know, as far as when is that bill going to be finalized, it's probably going to be finalized, I would suspect, and out before spring break. But it'll be over the next couple of weeks that all that will happen, give or take a little bit. And one thing about the way it has been done, I will say this, pretty much a lot of stuff has stopped and a lot of attention is being put on it and a lot of people are pouring thoughts into it through us and into the governor's office and into the Department of Ed as well. So if you got issues, we're here, come up afterwards, give it to us because we're working now to get that amendment. In fact, some leaders uh, have already submitted, as Keith said, those amendments and the governor's office is being very responsive to what we're asking for that we've heard from you. So if you got specific detail, come see us afterwards. And we'll close and say this. I checked on a number of bills filed. We are about 817, which are bills of substance, but also include Senate joint resolutions, Senate concurrent resolutions, uh, includes like the fiscal uh, bills that are coming out of the budget. And we are actually running lower in the number of bills filed this time than we have before. So the trend is down because we are paying uh, a lot of attention uh, to some of the heavier things. Second point I wanna make quickly is this. The bills that we run come from our constituent. It may not be you and you may not even be on the same side of the constituent that has come to us and said, I want this addressed. That is part of the democratic process is that somebody comes to us and says, I don't like a book that has sexually explicit stuff available in the library on the front page or in the library at the school, or I don't like the idea that we don't include rape and incest and abortion. All that stuff comes from constituents. It's not that we just sit up here and bring that stuff up. Some things we might come up that are personal to us, but it all comes to us from constituents. And I can't say to you, yeah, I'll do you, or I'll do, won't do you. You know, I try to listen to everybody. I think we all try to listen to everybody. That is part of the democratic process. We deal with stuff sometimes we don't like to deal with. And I just want to say this on the monument, because it was brought up, it may not be important to you that we remember over 250,000 babies that were aborted in this state, but it's important to me and a bunch of other people up there because we've got statutes up there for the Little Rock Nine, for the Vietnam veterans, and for the firemen and for everybody else. And it is my opinion, like it or not, those babies deserve to be remembered so we don't ever walk down that road again. Thank you. Uh, in closing, I just once again want to thank our sponsors, Patrick and Baldwin Shell, Riverside Grocery, for preparing the food. I um, want to thank our Chamber of Commerce in Benton, Bryant, and Hot Springs Village. The, the church here, you're phenomenal. Thank you for making sure our microphones work, opening the doors early in the morning, and getting us here. Our legislators, obviously, appreciate their openness, but I also appreciate you. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate you letting me be a dog with a bone in the uh, facilitation to get as many questions in and to allow each of you to give your opinions. Uh, I appreciate your passion and how much you care about this community and what we do. And I know our legislators appreciate that also. So thank you all. And we're on to the rest of our day now. Thank you.